Which countries or regions around the world stand out as exemplary when it comes to road safety in your mind? Oh, that's the European developed countries. Uh, they have very low um, rates of fatality. Down around, um, it's almost getting below three, and whereas Taiwan's rate per 100,000 is very high. Do you really think that Taiwan is a living hell for pedestrians? I think comparatively, the answer has to be yes. Taiwan's infrastructures, particularly in the uh, major cities, is not geared towards pedestrians at all. Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Tomasz Koper, sitting in for Divya Gopalan. Taiwan is generally considered one of the safest countries in the world, but not when it comes to one crucial aspect of life here, road safety. Take a look at this graph. It shows the total number of deaths from traffic accidents in Taiwan in recent years. At first glance, these figures may not look particularly high, but divide them by Taiwan's population of 23 million to get the per capita rate, and you realize that the averages are around five times higher than in other developed countries in the region like Japan. So what's wrong with Taiwan's traffic and what can we do to make it safer to get around? Well, to help us find answers to that question, we welcome Rafael Grzebieta, Professor Emeritus of Road Safety at the University of New South Wales and an adjunct professor at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, joining us from Sydney, Australia. And from Taipei, we welcome Ben Gorin, the Director of Communications at uh, Taiwan Policy Center, a non-profit organization based in Taiwan and the UK. So Ben, let me start with you. You've been uh, writing on um, Taiwan's traffic situations at length in the past. What do you make of these rising numbers of fatalities? Um, I would say that they're no surprise to me. Um, probably because there are now a number of, uh, an increasing number of vehicles on the road and uh, the vehicles themselves are larger than ever before with a lot of SUVs. Um, and there's a lot more competition for space on the road and the usage of the road, so, um, and pedestrians uh, suffer as a result, so they're not surprised to me. And um, Rafael, uh, you've spent your career uh, researching road safety, and I, I will draw on your expertise uh, later in the program, um, but I want to start with a general question to maybe kind of set the right expectations. Which countries or regions around the world stand out as exemplary when it comes to road safety in your mind? Oh, that's the European developed countries. Uh, for example, Sweden, um, the Netherlands, uh, United Kingdom. They have very low um, rates of fatality. Down around, um, it's almost getting below three. And in fact, I think it is below three per 100,000 uh, head of population. Whereas Taiwan's, um, uh, Taiwan's rate per 100,000 is very high. All right, before we move on, I would like to bring in one aspect here. In 2022, CNN published an article on the country's dangerous roads with the alarming title of Taiwan's living hell traffic is a tourism problem, say critics. It unsurprisingly ruffled quite a few feathers out over here, but it also put many deficiencies in road safety in the spotlight, one of them being road design. Taiwan Plus reporter Jeremy Olivier has this story on an alliance fighting for better and safer roads. Take a look. This busy street in central Taipei is just one of many where cars and scooters and people on foot all share the same space. Now, Taiwan is known as one of the safest countries in the world. It's also got a growing reputation for its dangerous roads. It's especially true for pedestrians. Over 600 people died after being hit on Taiwan's streets last year. It's a big jump from previous years. Now, a lot of this has to do with poor enforcement of traffic safety rules, something the government is trying to improve with new laws and steeper fines on drivers. But another issue are Taiwan's sidewalks and other pedestrian walkways. Now, these are often inconsistent, they're poorly kept, or they're used for purposes other than walking. But a new alliance of traffic safety groups is trying to bring awareness to this problem in Taiwan. They've got a list of demands, and that includes improving Taiwan's pedestrian areas. 
They say road design here has actually gotten worse over the past few decades. 在民国八十年代的道路，甚至是比较好的规划，就是还有实体的人行道，还有路缘，还有右转的车道。但是到同一个地，同一个地方。同一个地图，现在的图纸资料库它反而是没有的。And、the group says it wants to push for more people-oriented transportation. That means giving pedestrians more safe spaces to walk. With so many of Taiwan's streets, like this one, geared toward drivers, they may have a long road ahead before they can reach their goal of zero pedestrian deaths. John Su and Jeremy Olivier in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Now, we reached out to the Taipei City Police Department for a comment on enforcement and many other aspects of road safety, but our interview request was eventually declined due to the upcoming Lantern Festival. So, Ben, um, you were here, you were around when the CNN, the infamous CNN article came out. Um, do you really think that Taiwan is a living hell for pedestrians? It's a good question. I think comparatively, the answer has to be yes. Um, if only because compared, like、uh, the other guest said,、um, compared to other countries,、uh, Taiwan's infrastructure, particularly in the、uh, major cities, is not geared towards pedestrians at all.、Um, and you will find on sidewalks, pavements, a number of obstacles. Uh, such as uh, electricity poles,、uh, electricity generators, light poles,、uh, lamps,、um, various decorations and、uh, promotions from the shops, and then the、uh, pavements are also being shared increasingly with、um, bicyclists and also e-scooters and various other forms of mobility,、um, which makes it more crowded.、Um, and finally, the fact that there is a massive inconsistency in the pavements, so you may be. Able to use a pavement for one block or two blocks, and then you're not able to use a pavement at all. It doesn't exist, and of course, this is a problem not just for able-bodied、uh, pedestrians, but particularly for those、uh, with physical、um, disabilities or those who require a、um, wheelchair. Well. Rafael,、um, the video we just watched、uh, talks about the importance of road design in in keeping everyone safe.、Um, so, what kind of features of road design do you consider the most effective towards that goal, towards、uh, maintaining safety? Well, the road authorities and designers should really pursue the safe system approach. It's been accepted by the、uh, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, World Bank. It's promoted all over the world as the go-to、um, philosophy for、um, uh, ensuring the safety of all road users, not only pedestrians but also motorcycle scooter riders as well as drivers.、Um, and so, um, uh, walking should be seen as a priority area,、uh, pedestrians, for、um, the Taiwanese government is. Walking is a healthy activity. They should be pulling out all stops to make、um, pedestrian areas、um, very walkable,、uh, removing the obstructions, removing the sales、um, uh, pitches that shops have out the front,、um, getting those footpaths to be safe. Well, Ben, in in our previous conversation,、uh, you identified like four groups of factors that contribute to how unsafe Taiwanese roads are.、Um, can you quickly walk us through what they are? Okay.、Um, so basically,、uh, what I found from and this is not an academic study; it's anecdotal and from observation from using roads. But、um, the four factors would be cultural factors,、uh, built environment factors. Um, education factors, and the last one will be bureaucratic and economic factors. So, for example,、uh, cultural factors might be a lack of patience,、um, a desire for convenience,、um, and psychology of that,、um, including、uh, performative driving.、Um, built environment factors、um, would be the design of roads.、Um, Particularly that they are designed for logistical movement and not for pedestrians,、um, and the educational factors would be the teaching of the teaching pursuant to the driving test for scooters and cars、um, doesn't contain a number of factors that you find in other countries such as giveaway, right of way,、um, 
And then the final uh, uh, element is bureaucratic and economic factors, which is a big stumbling point, a big obstacle to getting any major change in Taiwan because uh, you have local governments, particularly in central governments, um, which are not proactive and are very scared of businesses and residents in terms of changing the, the built environment um, and putting the money into that to increase paving spaces and reducing road space. All right. Well, so as we've heard so far, road safety does lie at the intersection of many different factors. One of them is road culture and the habits of road users. HV Kumar, the founder of Highway King Club, spoke to us from India, a country with 10% of the world's automobiles, where, according to the World Bank and WHO, 22% of the world's traffic deaths occur. This is his take on the importance of habits. We also have the highest accident rate in the world. Number of fatalities in Indian roads is, uh, is, is below nobody. And this has been, uh, uh, for many years, we have been topping the rankings for several years now. I don't think uh, that is entirely the fault of the road infrastructure. Uh, for, as a motorist, I blame the motorist himself. Uh, we are so chaotic in our ways, disorganized in our driving. And road safety is uh, some of the least uh, of our priorities. Our bikers, uh, motorbikers ride without helmets. Cars uh, don't have functional seat belts. Uh, people buy cars because they're cheaper, not because they're safer. And uh, most of the accidents we have been seeing in recent years has been due to overspeeding. I think 60 or 70 percent of the accidents is due to overspeeding. And that's entirely the fault of the motorists. So, Raphael, um, do you agree uh, to the st with the statement that that uh, culture and kind of behavior is is the most crucial uh, factor, like we've heard from uh, H. V. Kumar? Um, because in Taiwan, the government often sort of wants to improve that through education. It's it's an intangible thing, um, and and for a lot of people, it must be difficult to change habits. Uh, just you know, in any aspect of life. So, so the, those educational campaigns that are, that are uh, favored by the Taiwanese government, do they work in changing habits and changing road culture, or are we looking at the wrong solution? Uh, it depends. It's, it's complex. You need all of the factors uh, to be um, considered, education. But education's tough. Um, in terms of getting returns for um, redu reduced fatalities and serious injuries. We found that um, training drivers, for example, post-licensure doesn't really work uh, in terms of reducing trauma. Um, the issue here is if you're going to educate the populace, then you need to also have enforcement um, uh, coupled with that. Education coupled with enforcement um, and good advertising, um, uh, information, passing on information to road users, that works. We've found that that works very well. But um, the issue here is to give people time to absorb what you're trying to get across. So, for example, let's have an, uh, having a campaign with seatbelts, getting people to wear seatbelts. You can run a campaign for a couple of months and just inform people educate them and say, look, this is what happens. You don't have a seat belt. See this person in a wheelchair didn't have a seat belt, fractured their, their neck. Um, however, and then after a couple of months, then you start to enforce and you start to find people. You start using the cameras, for example, those that have artificial intelligence that can capture people who are not wearing the seat belts and you ramp things up and that changes behavior because nothing changes behavior more than having to pay a fine. Another factor that you highlighted so re related to education is training and driver training. And um, well, from my personal experience, um, I have to say getting a license in Taiwan is incredibly easy. Um, do you find training here to be adequate uh, to prepare drivers and, and road users for being on the road? Absolutely not. And I would say that that starts with um, scooter drivers, where the test for a scooter driving license is ridiculously easy and is conducted uh, entirely within a, an artificial environment that doesn't match the actual 
uh, built environment that scooter drivers will be uh, driving on. And likewise for driving a car and getting a car driving license, um, only recently have uh, driving schools started to uh, take students onto the roads as part of their uh, practice for the test. Um, mostly, uh, new students will learn on an enclosed circuit that again does not match um, the built environment. And I would say that um, in terms of education, uh, one of the key factors that is missing in Taiwan is teaching awareness and anticipation and observation. But I would say that um, the key factor for me when I look at those four is the built environment um, and the Chevron's paradox, which is the more roads that you build, the more traffic uses them. And so what we should be doing is actually reducing the width of roads, reducing the number of lanes and increasing the uh, uh, options for pedestrians and buses, dedicated lanes just for cyclists, pedestrians and buses. Um, and that would actually reduce the traffic and help um, make streets safer and slower. Well, uh, staying with uh, driver training just for a little bit, just so we kind of see an example of uh, how it's done differently. Uh, Raphael, I know in Australia, driver training looks very, very different. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, well, uh, to get your license in some states, you have to do at least 120 hours of learner driver. Uh, that can be either with uh, a parent or another fully licensed person um, or with a, a driver trainer. Also, um, it, we have the, what's called the graduated driver licensing system. So over a period of five years, just like a pilot would get their license to fly an aircraft. I mean, as soon as you get your license, pilot's license, you don't go flying jumbos straight away. You have to work your way through the system. And similarly for driving a car, um, the whole idea is to get the maximum number of hours um, in, in your vehicle preferably under supervision at the start. So that's why we require 120 hours of, do of, of, of documented uh, driving. And then when you get your license, you go on a restricted system. In other words, you cannot carry passengers uh, because other passengers, you might, like young people, they can get edged on by other young people in the car to go and do reckless things in the vehicle. So um, you have uh, certain curfews as well, uh, night driving, you can only drive by yourself, you can't drive with extra passengers in the first year, etc. And so you work your way through the system to get your full licence. Having a licence is a privilege. That's what needs to be instilled into the population. If you have a license, that means you can, you have greater mobility. Uh, and so that has to be treated as a privilege. So Raphael, uh, how do you see the, te the role of technology in, in improving road safety in the future? Oh, it's enormous. It's, uh, we're on the cusp of a situation where it's, it's like um, uh, at airports, you have controlled airspace. We will have controlled vehicle um, uh, driving. In other words, the system will take control of your vehicle in high risk areas and may actually guide your vehicle. That's where we're heading to, self-driving um, uh, vehicles. However, um, we do have the technology right now uh, in speed cameras where, and they're using it in, um, uh, in, in New South Wales. Uh, in Australia to detect people not wearing seat belts, detect people not um, uh, using a mobile phone. Using mobile phones is particularly dangerous. We've noted at least it's, 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 it's uh, caused a, around about a 20 to 30% increase in uh, serious crash injuries because when your people are being distracted by their phones. And these cameras now are starting to detect that. So I think um, uh, using this technology to advance road safety is, is really important, critical, and should be adopted straight away. Well, Ben, um, Taiwan, as we know, is full of technology, technology island. And on the other hand, it's also no secret that ro traffic rule enforcement, there is space to, for improvement. Um, so should Taiwan then lean into AI-driven solutions, technology solutions to improve enforcement of traffic laws? 
I'm a little bit suspicious of leaning heavily into any one solution, and particularly technology, um, since it, it needs a uh, period of bedding in and testing uh, before it can become reliable and consistent that people can rely on. I wouldn't reject it out of hand. I think in Taiwan, one thing that can be done immediately is that if you cause a death or a life-changing injury, um, with negligent use of a vehicle, you should lose your license for life. And that's um, something that would immediately make a change of behavior in Taiwan. As you pointed out earlier, and as Raphael has pointed out, is that the fear of a genuine penalty that causes inconvenience or a serious financial uh, cost will actually change um, behavior far great, far quicker than uh, changing the driving test or the, uh, the driving rules. Well, speaking of uh, relatively faster solutions, uh, Raphael, I know you've been advocating for lowering the speed limit uh, from the default 50 kilometers per hour, as it is in many countries, including Taiwan, to 40. Uh, now, wh what are the benefits of doing that? Okay, it's, it's the laws of physics. If you're driving through a, um, uh, a residential area, uh, a suburb, or a poorly lit area, uh, what you find is that um, if you're driving at 50 kilometres per hour and your vehicle is set to low beam, um, uh, in other words, it's, it's set for uh, the urban environment, which is a requirement when you go into residential, drive into residential areas. Um, you'll find that you will hit or strike the pedestrian at 50 kilometres per hour. You won't have time to perceive and observe and apply your brakes unless you're exceptionally skilled. And it's a, it's a human factor which you can't change. So, but setting the speed limit in the urban environment to 40 kilometres per hour, you have enough time in that one and a half seconds perception reaction time to see the pedestrian. And so you can break the vehicle to 30 kilometres per hour. Now, 30 kilometres per hour is equivalent to falling off the roof of your house if you're struck by a car. If you're struck at 50, that's like um, falling off a two-storey building. And so uh, the risk of death um, uh, at 50 kilometres per hour is somewhere between 40 to 60 percent, whereas at 30, it's, a it's below 10 percent. And so that's why you're seeing countries like the Netherlands, um, uh, uh, Sweden, uh, the UK, they're all going to these um, uh, 30 kilometres per hour um, uh, speed limits for the CBD. Uh, we did a systematic review of um, quite a number of um, uh, papers on this, and we came up with a value of about 40 kilometres per hour. And that, that is consistent with the laws of physics. It's also consistent with um, studies of um, pedestrians who have suffered fractures to their skull and to their, to their neck. Um, roughly, it starts to ramp up exponentially at about 40 kilometers per hour. So 40 is a pretty good speed to, to choose. We will have to hit the brakes on the show really soon, but before we do that, I would like to lighten the mood a little bit. And to do that, we give you a traffic rap battle written and performed by our resident rapper, Ander Saucy. So fasten your seatbelts and put your hands at nine and three because we're going for a ride. Ander Saucy. Check it. I'm an average guy, just got off work at a reasonable time, feeling pretty good because my boss just paid me. But let me tell you, my commute is crazy. It's almost like I'm the only one who knows that red means stop and green means go and yellow does not mean accelerate. Just how many people do I need to educate? Ugh, and it's only six blocks, but at every intersection I encounter gridlock because people don't have good habits, man, and they're always causing a traffic jam. The roads are more congested than me when I had the flu. Every second is a scramble to figure out what to do. I want to catch the body and dong with my ama, but you're blocking the way to pick your kids up from school. You're parked in the middle of the street. That's real inconvenient. Why can't you be like that guy and ride a motorcycle? At least you take up less space. Oh, wow. Finally, you see me? On the road, you barely even notice I'm there. The other day, I was on my way to the eye doctor, but then you burst right into my lane. I've had enough. Car drivers are inconsistent. I 
can never guess your intentions You'll suddenly turn with no warning Driver's etiquette non-existent You never give enough response time to hit the brakes One time I flew off my bike and I hit my face on the curb And yes it really hurt but I still had to get up and show up to work Each second on the road gets tougher and tougher I'm bumper to bumper, everybody's trying to cut me Rush me, one wrong move they'll crush me But you? You got the comfort of the car with the heated seat pads You can listen to a podcast on your iPad And I get that, everybody has places they need to be at But me and the guy next to me were basically touching kneecaps I'm just saying, you guys have it easy Cars have motion sensors, yet you still lack judgment It really makes you wonder what you're doing behind those tinted windows No comment Okay, okay Well, if you can't handle the pressure, maybe you shouldn't even be on the road How about you try walking for a change? Walking? You mean like that guy over there? Hey Don't drag me into this, I'm just minding my own business. But quite frankly, both of you are the problem. You think walking is safer? Well, it's not, cause no vehicle seems to know when to stop. My mama always told me to look both ways three times before I even think to cross. Y'all always jump on the slightest chance to make a turn before the light turns red. I know that the traffic lights aren't in sync, but you still need a yield for pedestrians. And the same applies when it's a green light. It's not like I can magically disappear out of sight. And may I just say this pedestrian walkway? It might as well not be there. I'm spiteful towards the motorcycles and the bicycles that fight for my right of way. I despise when they ride on the sidewalk. That behavior drives me insane. No pun intended. Please be attentive. The countdown still has at least five seconds. Oh, no. I might not make it to the other side in time. I need to start running. Oh, the cars. Oh, what? Ooh. Okay, but we both agree that bus drivers are the worst, right? Oh, don't get me started. That was, uh, once again, Anders Ossi, our resident rapper. Thank you for that very much. And thank you to both my guests today, uh, Rafael Xavieta, Professor Emeritus of Road Safety at the University of New South Wales, and Adjunct Professor at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, speaking to us from Sydney, Australia. And from Taipei, uh, Ben Goran, the Director of Communications at Taiwan Policy Center, a nonprofit organization based in Taiwan and the UK. Thank you both for being on the show. And to our viewers at home, it's been great to have your company today. If you'd like to join the conversation, you can visit our social media and leave us a comment there. Thank you for sticking around. And remember, stay informed, stay engaged, and stay connected.